Uh, I just want to confirm, Paul, please, if you could confirm, can you see my screen and can you hear me? You should be seeing the PowerPoint Investment Builder Series, Suite 4 Tips and Tricks. Paul probably got his phone on mute. So um, maybe just one of you uh, in the Don, chat. Don, yes. we can hear you. Can you see my screen that says the PowerPoint Investment Builder Series? Yes. Okay, very good. Just wanted to make sure of that before we get ourselves started, before we get ourselves moving. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. So our, our session for today, um, I will be doing the presentation. I'm the Director of uh, Client Solutions. Many of you I've had the chance to meet before. Uh, we really appreciate you spending your time with us. I know we can't really say there's a slow season anymore, and any time that you invest uh, is appreciated because your time is your time is special. Paul Pacini is also on with us. Paul will be available uh, at the end of our session for our questions and answers. Our objectives in this course is to increase your learning about the docket products, uh, to help uh, impart best practice knowledge that we gather working with uh, all of our client base and professional accountants, and uh, to learn how to serve your clients better. We want to equip you with more tools and more information so that you would be able to do that. Our agenda for today will be some very, very brief housekeeping. Uh, we'll speak about uh, the uh, future topics and our dates that we have coming up. We will actually do a demonstration of a number of tips and tricks, and then we will have Q&A with Paul Pacini, who is our Director of Research and Development. For housekeeping, your phones are on mute. During the session, questions may arise. Please feel free to ask your questions. There is a question section on the GoToWebinar panel. Please uh, take a look. Um, if you want to ask a question, Paul will be going through some of the questions as the presentation proceeds. We'll answer as many that he can. And we will take some of those questions during the questions and answer session and uh, use those and present them to the group so that we can get some increased learning. So your questions really help to make this presentation better. Um, it's a part of your feedback. It's a part of what we can do to help you. And uh, sometimes we get some great ideas out of your questions. So please, feel free to ask those questions. Just go to your GoToWebinar panel. And one of the buttons there will uh, allow you to ask questions. All right. So future topics. We have two future topics on December 17th, Wednesday, December 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern. We will have uh, a review of the items to be in the December software release. So the various items, the enhancements, some of the more major um, or major adjustments that there have been to the software, we will go through those and we'll present those to you so that you can become aware of what will be available in that release. That will be the last major release that's available for tax season. Um, there are some things specifically pointing towards tax season, so we've, um, that's a very important release for us. And then our final session for the year will be on Wednesday, January the 7th at 1 p.m. Eastern. We're going to call it Tax Warm-Up, and it's just things you can do, um, getting ready for tax season, how you can utilize Docket for tax, uh, some things you can do to make sure that your system is right ready and ready to go as you head into the season. So there, those are the final two sessions that we will have um, scheduled for you, and we will be sending out um, invitations and things like that. So we look forward to you also being present and attending in those sessions. So we're actually going to spend almost the entire entirety of today on the presentation itself. Um, this will this, this is what we need to do. It is a very practical working session. There will be uh, there will be one area that I'm going to need to come back, and it will be best for us then just to utilize uh, PowerPoint again. Uh, until then, though, uh, we will do most of our tips and tricks right in the software showing you what is there and showing you what is available. I'm going to take me just a little bit here to flip my system between sessions. So just bear with me for a second while I have to do a couple of little technical things. And let me get my GoToWebinar panel back. And let me change this so that you can see my actual system. There we go. Let's just wait uh, to minimize my PowerPoint that I was seeing. And there we are. So now you should be seeing. I can see it. Uh, I can see what you're viewing. I can see the, um, I can see the uh, docket dashboard. So what we have is we have about, uh, there's about 27 different topics. One is really has five topics inside it. But let's, let's call it 
20 something topics that we'd like to go through. Some of these may be things that you know, some of these may be things that you're not aware of. Um, the idea here is that we can uh, get things, um, we can just discuss some things, show you some potentially new things. Some of these are best practices. Uh, some of these are things that um, you know you might not even be aware that they're in the software and we thought that it would be important for you to know about. Some of these are results of questions that we get in support that we thought in our customer care department, we thought that it would be important to point some of these out to you. So the first one has to do with our dashboard. In our dashboard, there is an ability to reflect what appears on your dashboard. Here in the bottom left of your screen, there is, if I stop moving around, there is the, uh, the you can customize the dashboard. Down the bottom left, I will click and customize. And there's two different ways uh, that we would suggest that you would set up your, um, you would set up this screen. Um, our best practice is two ways. One, if you are using workflow. Um, one would be if we are uh, not using our workflow. This will all be the presentation for today will be 100% in Docket Suite 4. Um, there's a question as to what version are you using, what version are you presenting, so the entire presentation will be in Docket Suite 4. Here we have the, the layout of the grids. If one is using workflow, um, our best practice would be under that you would lay out the grid in two columns. You would show recent binders, you would show assigned to me binders, and you should always have this auto refresh on. So what it's actually showing you is work binders that are assigned to you, and it's showing you recent binders that you have access. If one is not using workflow, then the, the best practice would be, we can just change it like this, to show recent binders you are in, or recent documents that you're in. We find that sometimes showing all four is just a little bit too much information on. So this would be the layout if one is not using workflow. If one is using workflow, this would be the layout here. So just a little best practice. Uh, people can set up really their screens as they want. And if they want their screen to be set up uh, away individually, they want four, that's fine. But just be aware that it can be customized. It's customized at the local machine level. And uh, your people can set that up how they want. We wanted to, as a second topic, just kind of touch on a couple of the uh, security issues that there are that are in the system. And of the security issues that there are in the system, we were going to, um, we were going to just go in under the maintenance menu. Under the maintenance menu, Beside the clients, we have something here that I'm going to be circling. It's called client security. Now, client security, as I click on it, what it does is it brings up a list of clients. Some of you may be aware of how we have two different types of security in the system. One that we call functional security. That's going to control who can do what functions in the software. So that is who would have access to all of the items on the main menu, who would have access to the items in uh, the maintenance menu. Some of the specific functions relating to Binder and Archive are also listed. That is who can perform what functions. The second type of security that we have in the system is something called content. Who has access to content? And when you can access that content, what is the global rules of what you can do with it? And we have three levels of control. A, one has full rights. One has full access to the content, which means you can see the content, you can modify the content, you can, uh, oh, sorry, Anthony, uh, you'd ask the question, what version? Um, I'm using version 402 today. That is the, uh, the most current global release. There is a sub-release 413. Uh, build 413 is really just have some bugs fixed in it that were in version 402. So 402, 413, for all intents and purposes of what you're seeing, are exactly the same. So I, I hope that uh, I've cleaned that up for you. So this is build 402, which from a physical standpoint appears exactly the same as build 413. All right. Uh, so coming back to the security, you if one has full rights, they can modify, they can add, they can delete, they can see all the files underneath a folder, if that's what specifically you're looking at. So full rights means you have wide open permission. By definition, everyone has full rights. Um, except if there's restrictions put on it. The second level of content security is to have view rights, which means you can see the files, but you cannot change them, you can't move them, you cannot edit them in any way. And the third level of content is deny. And if one is denied, they can't see. So if I was at a client and I denied someone, they would not be able to see anything about the client. They can't see their archive, they cannot see their binders, they're restricted and denied access to anything of the client. 
If I'm on a work binder, I could put on security, I could deny them to a binder. If it was an archive, I could deny them to an archive. We even can go to folder security, right down into the folders of binders or the folders of um, or the folders of um, sorry, the folders of um, uh, of a binder or of the archive. So our security can get very granular. In this instance, I wanted to just mention client security. So I have here a test client. Down across the bottom, as we have in all of our master files, we have the ability to edit. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to edit the security on this client. You can see here on the right side, no security has been defined on this client, which means that for the client, um, everybody has wide open access to this client. Now we can control our security as it relates to an individual user or as it relates to a group of users. In maintenance, we do have a area called security groups. You can create groups and put users in them. So let me just come back to client security. So in this instance, I'm just going to say for a user, if I go in for a user, here's the users in my system, I can say, great, for this person here, I can change, I can set up their security. Automatically, they have full rights, but I could deny. And if I said deny, what happens is I've said DMRE, that DMRE is denied access to this client. That means they cannot get into their archives, they cannot get into their binders, they cannot, be, they cannot get in and do things. Um, we, can, we can restrict what they can do and what they can get into. So this would be controlling right at a client level. So sometimes maybe um, you allow people to do their own personal tax return and uh, everybody else needs to be denied. So somebody has to have the rights. Usually it is an administrator has the rights to be able to control this. Um, an administrator can control who can have access to clients. Um, they could go in at a, at a binder level, and they can be right down to the folder level. They could be controlling um, whether one has view rights or one is denied. That's into the archive. That's into a work binder. We have all of these controls that are available so that you can get right down to the folder level, and um, you can control access, whether that's in the archive, whether that is in the binder. Uh, we can control it against templates and then any clients that use the template. But be aware that there is client security and you can control. This can be very important, um, like maybe you have an account that you do public audits uh, and you only do a couple of them. Uh, you can control who has access because um, you have to be very careful that only people who are working on that audit or you know, their tax or whatever the case may be, they should be able to, um, they should be able to uh, restrict who can get in. So we just wanted to make you aware that there is this client security function, and it would make it possible for you to uh, control and how people can get in. Another element of control has to do with inboxes. I'm just going to explain inboxes, and they are different than how it worked in version 3. In version 3, we were controlling the inbox. They were sitting in Windows, so it was being controlled by the file server, whereas the inboxes are really just a type of binder and you have inbox binders, you have work binders, you have archive binders, you have template binders. These are all different types of binders that we're utilizing Docket Database to control. Now, within inboxes, technically, at my inbox, yes, is proprietary to me, and uh, I have access to it, but technically, if people know how to use Binder Explorer, and they get good at using searches in Binder Explorer, they can find, very simply, all of the inboxes in the system. And sometimes there might be information in an inbox that you don't want someone to have access to. As we were just talking about security, you could go in technically and deny people having access to inboxes. And that's okay if I had five employees, that wouldn't be too hard because I could say, great, I want to be the only person with access to mine and deny everybody else and go conversely through each person and deny. But it's a lot trickier if I have 100 employees. I don't want to sit there and deny 99 people from my inbox and 99 from every person's inbox. And then when I hire the 101st person, I've got to go through 100 inboxes and deny that person from. So what we have is we have a little utility here that's called Update User Inbox Security. Now what this does is this will do one of two things. If it updates the user inbox security, it goes and says, great, Don's inbox, only Don has access to. Roger's inbox, only Roger has access to. Joanne's, only Joanne has access to. And it goes in and it sets up the security so it's going to deny everyone else except the primary user being access, having access to their own inboxes. 
And if you say yes, it will go through and it will apply that security to each person. And now, only the specific user can access their own inbox. If you were to hire a new employee and add them in as an additional user, you'd run this again, because just as in the case of the 101st client that I had just spoken about, um, that 101st person that would have no security on, by just clicking this, it would reassign it. If you click clear it, it removes all those, and again, technically, everyone could see everyone else's inbox. If there was anything else that you wanted to do to change security to give different accesses, you'd have to go through and make manual amendments by going to the inbox template or going to the specific inbox of a user, and we can apply security to, um, to that inbox the same way we could apply security to our client or to any template that we have. So this is just a tool that really helps you, and especially I think once you break about five employees, this can be a very helpful tool. Uh, but just remember that if you apply security every time, um, every time you deny, what happens is that those people then will not have access to it. Okay, only the primary person has access to it. So those are a couple little things of security we thought we'd just touch on. Uh, some things to maybe help you with, maybe open some horizons of some things of how you would uh, associate how these these things would work. So we're going to go into Binder Explorer, touch on a few topics in Binder Explorer. Uh, there are, uh, we were aware of, we have the two searches at the top, and these, these, these are a couple of support questions that we thought that we'd, we'd help you with. You know, obviously I can go in and do my type ahead and get my client, so I've done a client search. I also can use my save searches, and just as we were talking, I could theoretically see the inboxes. Now here, yes, I'm seeing, <coughs> excuse me, all of the inboxes. I am logged in as the admin user. Yeah, and we, we have to appreciate that the admin user is above security in the entire system. So the admin user is the, the power user. So as the admin user, I can still see all of the inbox. Now, I'm here, I'm using a save search. Here, I had my client search. If you want to move back and forth, if I wanted to move back to this client search, there's a little blue arrow here. If I click on that little blue arrow, it's now moved back to my client search. How is it that we know which search is active? Here to the left, see how the word client is in blue? That means that that is the search that has been invoked. If I have to click on the little blue arrow to the right of the inboxes, the save searches box lights up in blue to tell you this is, this is demonstrating, this is displaying the save search. So you can always tell which search you're, you're utilizing by virtue of which one is lit up. All right. Let's go in and let's just pull up a different search here. And I'm going to go into work binders. I'm going to pull up a whole series of work binders. And let me just full size that. I'm going to bring a column across. Yes, you can drag columns around where you want them to be. I want to do this for purposes of demonstration. One of the fields, when we create a binder, so whenever a binder is created, it defaults the year and it's based on what current year we are in. So if I'm creating a binder, um, it's going to default, if I go to create a binder from a template, it's going to default the year to be 2014. It may be that I need to change that. So here in the case, I've got a 2013 review file. And when I set it up, I didn't make the year 2013. It defaults to the year 2014, because that's when I created this binder. But if I wanted to go back and I wanted to change it, I always can. And here the, we could go in and change one at a time by going into the binder properties. And I could go into the binder properties, and I could say, oh, I want to make this a 2013. I could type that, or I could click through it. I could make a one change, a single change there, and it's going to change that year to 2013. But what I also could do is I can do mass updates. So I can do mass updates to binders. Now, I can only make this if these binders have not been published or have not been finalized. Once they're finalized, I can't change it. But if I wanted to go in and I wanted to change a few of these, uh, maybe I wanted to change a few of them to be a particular year. Of course, when you go to do this, here we go. So if I wanted to change those, I can always go in and use this facility that was added to version 402. I could always add those to the version here of, to, sorry, to utilize this multiple properties document. So when I click on the multi, change the properties of multiple things, uh, I, uh, well, there's no states on these ones. But when, if, if there are states, I could use the multiple properties. 
Um, if I didn't, if I wasn't using workflow, I would have to go in one by one and actually change the properties. But if I'm using workflow and states exist for these binders, I'm able to go in. Maybe I wanted to change um, this population here. I could go in and change this population here, and I could just say, "Great, I want to make the binder year 2013." Or I could just type it and just paint down, pop one. There I go. I could be changing all of those binder years to 2013. Now, the only time you can use that multiple it currently is if there is a state assigned. Um, if there is no state assigned, what I have to do is I have to go in and um, I have to go in and um, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to go and do the one by one through the binder property. So if you are using workflow, one of the big things um, there are a couple more tools in your arsenal. So one of the things that you could do there is you could uh, change those multiple binders versus just change uh, multiple properties. Okay, the next thing that I want to uh, just touch on is filtering in your screen. Now this screen here happens to have a lot of information on it. Uh, you know, there's, there's just a lot of information on the screen. Maybe I want to filter and I only want to see the information where B. Smith is the partner. <clears throat> so filtering is just a matter of clicking on the particular field. So I'm going to click on partner Bill Smith. I could have clicked on any one of these. I'm going to right click and I can say either include Bill Smith or exclude. So in this case, I'm going to say include. So now I'm only seeing Bill Smith. And if I wanted to say, great, I want to exclude anything that's 2013, I could say exclude. So I just filtered this information to show me all the Bill Smith projects that are not 2013. And if I wanted to, I could further say, I just want to include personal facts. Now, there's nowhere that demonstrates for us what all the filters were that I selected. Uh, because I was doing it myself, I do know what I did. There's nothing demonstrating these are the various levels that you have included or excluded. But in this case, I saw all the Bill Smiths that were not 2013 that were personal facts, and I filtered that screen. Here in red, it is telling me there's 15 records in my selection. It's still working off of this particular save search, but in red, it's telling me this data is filtered. This data is filtered, meaning it's safe search, but not the entire population. You've either filtered things out or only asked for certain things. So in this case, if I wanted to clear my filters, here is the symbol for clear filter. I can clear my filters by clicking on it, and what it does is it puts my screen back to either the search that I was in, whatever that was, a safe search or a client search. So it's really important to be able to use filtering. And filtering doesn't just work here on Binder Explorer. Um, I could be in the Create Publication screen, and I can filter. Um, I could be in. I could be reviewing the job queue of um, of items, and I only want to look at the current batch, the last batch that I submitted. Uh, we have these filterings, even if it's not visible. Like they, um, you know, you can always right click and filter. Whenever there's a grid, a grid is where there's columns and rows of information. That's a grid. I could go into a binder. I could say right click and say Show All. And I can filter, say, only include the PDFs. And now I've filtered that show all down to just say, I want to see the PDFs. Then I can select them all and open them all in the PDF editor. So be aware that this filtering, although a powerful tool in Binder Explorer, you can utilize filtering wherever we are in the system. We can customize how this screen looks. And we need our screens to look different. I just spoke with someone this morning, and they said, why would you not have one standard of how everyone's screen would look? And I said, well, I may have a staff who does a lot of publishing. And doing a lot of publishing, very important to them with publishing, over to the right, I've got a couple of columns here. And one of the columns is publishing, and is it finalized or not? And those are two very important uh, items when I'm going to pick a population to publish or to, to finalize, and I'm going to pick a population to roll forward. And they would want to know that information. They would probably want to see that on their screen at all times. Oftentimes, partners would want to see if they are the partner. So that, for example, I could be filtering by partner, or uh, I'm a partner and I want to see all the work that my managers are working on. There's a column for manager. I could be doing filters to say, great, only show me where I'm the partner, and I could look at a specific manager's work. So there's different needs. As a partner, I may want to, especially in a larger firm, I may want to see different columns. If I was an employee, an administrative employee, some of these things may or may not be as important to me. So what we can do is we can select individually what we want in our screen. 
Now, we can select the position. So I could take this here, hold my mouse down. I'm just dragging it to the right, and I've moved the position of where my year is. And maybe for me, it's really handy to have the year right here because it's something I want to see all the time. I could put it wherever I want. And when I exit the docket system, it will remember this, and it will, um, it will call it. When I open up this screen, it'll remember where it was, and it'll put it here. If there's items that you don't want on the screen, we don't have the ability to say, OK, don't show that item on the screen. What we can do, though, is we can move it over to the right. And maybe I don't need to see as much of this screen as I'm showing, and I could have my Binder Explorer set like this. And maybe this is all that I really want to see on my screen. And I could maybe make this a little wider. And there we go. Maybe that's all I want to see. I could set my Binder Explorer screen so it opens like this. And yes, there is a lot of information over here to the far right side. But this is all that I need to see. So that's all I'm going to have come up. Maybe I'll make that a little wider. That's all I'm going to have come up on my screen. And the system will retain the setting. And it's unique. It's individualized to you. I'm just going to kind of set this back because I have a set way that I, I do things. I'm going to move this one back. But I can put things where I want them so that the information that's important to be able to be seen on the screen is visible to me and things that I don't need on the screen. I can make sure that they are um, that they're away and maybe just make this a little narrow. Uh, there I go. I want to see who the assignment is, and I can just set my screen how I want, and the screen will save this when I come off and on the screen. We do have uh, we do have something in the system called managed searches, and that's what drives these. A managed search is a search. Now I'm just going to go under Work Binder. This is a search. It's here. I'm sorry. I did this quickly. The button right here with the binoculars, not the one with the, the lightning bolt. The lightning bolt is a quick search. But I can create a search, which is really just a SQL script that's being created, um, to say how I want data returned from the, um, how I want my data to be returned from the database. Now, I do have, uh, I do have um, a search in here. What's the one that I wanted to see? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I forget which one. Uh, let's just go into finalize binders. So this is showing me all of the binders in the system that are ready to be finalized. And I may want this search. I may build this search. And here's my search. If I ever wanted to change a criteria, I can always change a criteria for a search one time. Any one of these criteria, I can turn it off by clicking on the minus sign. If I wanted to see a different um, I wanted to see a different search for this. I could say, great, I want to see, and I just I wanted to include the deleted. It doesn't really make a lot of sense in here. But I know what it was, templates. I knew it was templates. I knew what the field was I wanted to remove. Here we go. Templates. This is a very simple search. So it's bringing me up all of the, it's showing me all of the templates. In this instance, it's showing me the templates. So that it's, yes, it's a template. And the deleted field equals no. So I'm only seeing the active templates, not the deleted ones. If I ever wanted to find a deleted one, I can do a one-time change here just to say, I'm going to remove the deleted by clicking on the minus. And if I search, I'm now seeing, I'll just close this, I'm now seeing all of the templates, whether they're deleted or not, because there's this lovely deleted field. And here's one now that's appearing, because it's, yes, it's deleted. And here's one that's appearing. And if I wanted to, I could right click and I could always restore a binder, whether that's a template binder, whether that's an active binder. But all I did was I went into my manage search and I removed a criteria. One, two, I could have added criteria. As long as I don't save it, this search is not changed. While I'm in this instance of Binder Explorer, that search remains. If I close and I go back into my Binder Explorer, because I did not save that search, it's back to its default position. Now if I go back into the templates, I go back here, the deleted function is still on. So you can one time just remove or add criteria and search. But I don't need to save that because I only do it very irregularly. If I wanted to, I could change it and do a save as, and I would have another search, templates active only, or you know whatever you want. Um, sometimes I just don't need to save them because it's very one-off. But just be aware that you can always change the criteria and research. And by doing that, um, by doing that, it'll be uh, it'll be very very handy for us. Uh, it'll be very very handy when we can just manipulate searches. 
Another thing, be aware that whenever you're on a grid, here, in a work binder, in the publishing, anywhere in an inbox, a grid of data can always be exported. If I just am on the grid and I hit right click, you can export a grid to an Excel file. And this is one means sometimes that people will use for reporting. So you don't need to really create a, um, you don't really need to uh, go create a report. If, was some, if this was just the information you wanted, you could take it, throw it off to Excel. Uh, once it goes off to Excel, you know, I can bring it into pivot tables. I could use Excel filter. I can do what I want. But this is one form of reporting. And this is available wherever you have a grid. Uh, I was working with a client, and they wanted to make some changes to the client master file. And they said, well, how do I get a list of all of the, how do I get a list of all of my clients? So I said, oh, okay, we can do that easily. Let's go into the client master file. From the client master file, I said, let's go right click. Let's export this to Excel. And you'll have client name, client type. You'll have all of the information here. And if they wanted to make changes to the client master files en masse, they could then just drop that into the template, change the fields they wanted to change re-import it, and they would make en masse changes to the client master file. So this export to grid could be handy, but this is a grid. There are columns and there are rows of data, therefore there's an export. And that is common throughout the system that you can export this information to a grid. Okay, let's move on. I'm going to actually move on into some topics now into work binders. And this is going to include just a few things that we could do. Uh, let's go in. Let's go to a, um, let's just go into a particular client, and let's go to a work binder. So I'm just going to open up a work binder. Whenever I'm on a file, if I want to change the name, theoretically, I could click here on the document property icon. I could technically right click, and I could go rename document. Something else that you could do is you just hit the F2 button, the function 2 button, and the function 2 button will come up and bring up the document property. You must actually be clicked on the file. Um, it's not enough that it's just kind of parked. Um, but as long as the file is up in the previewer or it's clicked onto the file, you know, if I click and I hit F2, I'm going to be able to bring up document properties so I can change the name. So just be aware. It's a quick little thing. This worked in my inbox. This worked in the group inbox. This worked in the work binder. You can uh, rename a file. So a little function that's in the system. I only explored, I only found that one out about uh, two weeks ago. So when this course was coming, I thought that would be a, a cute one that we could do. Um, drag and drop. Generally with drag and drop, the way we've always taught it is, if you're drag and dropping, first select the folder you want to bring something into, and then drag it down here into the document window. That is 100% true when you're doing drag and drop from Outlook. You have to select the folder. You drag it to the document area. But if I'm doing a drag and drop from my inbox, let me just get my inbox open here. It takes a bit of a hassle here to set this up on one monitor. But if I'm going to take a file from my inbox, and let me get my binder back up. If I want to take a file from my inbox and I want to drag it, now I'm just a little bit wide here. I don't know if I'll get this kind of how I want this set up. I want to take this file and I want to drag it. I don't have to click on the file I want. If I'm coming from Windows, or if I'm coming from uh, my inbox, I can just take this file and I can drag to the folder. And if I drag it to the folder, it's going to move, but I don't have to drag it down below. So I haven't clicked on the folder. Again, I can use my control key to make a copy. And that file will be copied into the wages. And there it is. The file was copied there into the wages section. So you can take a file and you can just select the folder you want to put it in, and it will drag and drop it into that folder. Now again, it's going to be a move from inbox, a move from Windows. You have to use a control key to make it a copy. But rather than say, well, I'm going to go click on the wages, I'm going to drag it into the document area, you can just drag it to the folder name. But you can only do that from Windows and from um, my inbox. You cannot do that when you're dragging from Outlook. I'm going to assume you can do that when you're dragging from Caseware, but um, I'm just going to be uh, stopping it back there for a second. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can because it uses the same functionality. Okay, so that's drag and drop a little, can make it just a little bit faster. You can drag to the folder name. Again, you can't do that in with Outlook. You have to actually click on the folder and then drag it in. I don't know why. You know, sometimes I don't know why things are that way in the software, but I do know that um, that's the way it has to work. Something you could have when you're on any document, 
uh, we have a field called document state. Um, document state, how it works is it, it comes up here. It can come up here in my, my list. Um, I can create whatever states I want. I have a prepared and reviewed. These replace the check marks that were in version 3.6. Um, and I can mark a document having been prepared, or I can mark, mark a document as having been reviewed, and I can always move it back and forth. And as these things are moving, um, it is writing these events into something called the state history. Um, you'd always be able to see the state history of who marked it as prepared, as reviewed, as prepared, as reviewed, or whatever state you happen to create. You can create whatever ones you want. Where states are actually created is back in the maintenance system. So I come back in under maintenance, under document states. So here I have a prepared stamp. I have a reviewed stamp. When I am creating this prepared and reviewed, sorry, a prepared state and a reviewed state, the master file just has the name, but this must be turned on. Show on menu means when you right click, it will show on the menu. So whatever you set up as document states, you can utilize those in your inbox. You can utilize those when you're here in um, when you're here in the, or when you're working in a work binder. You can have states, whatever you want. You can these two come. Uh, these come these two come with the system but you can create whatever ones you want technically you can make a color for each state I found when I first started playing with the new uh, suite 4 when it first was created I had some colors um, I found it just became that there was just too much information on the screen and it became overwhelming so I don't color my uh, my, my uh, states anymore uh, you know if you can do it on binder states you can do it on document states but it just became overwhelming there was too much color on the screen one other little hint in maintenance, there's something called document categories. You need to create a category and put those states in it for them to appear on your screen. There must be a document category, just the way the system is written. We suggest you have an uncategorized category, and it's just a category. These need to sit in one. It's just a functionality of how the system works, and I have my prepared and reviewed. And when I have this set up this way that people can change it, when it comes up in my right click. So it's just a part of the setup. You also have to have a document category and put those in. So it's just a part of the setup in order to be able to use that. Um, back in binders, so I'll come back in my maintenance. Back in binders, and in my binder, I'm just going to go to templates for a second here. Let me go off to my templates through my safe searches. In the templates, you can add a templated document. Now, what a templated document is, maybe I have a personal tax. Uh, maybe there's some document that we do for every client. Maybe there's an instruction sheet. Maybe there's um, some clients who are not using workflow may have a manual routing sheet. Whatever the case may be, you can put documents into the template, and they can be Word and Excel and PDF. And when you open the binder, that file automatically appears in the binder. So if I create a binder from a template, and there's a templated document, that document automatically appears in the binder. So I can add a templated document. I use the same functions to add documents as I would in a binder. My file then would arrive. So if I had one, it would arrive. We suggest you use something like an administration folder. You use a folder that's not going to be archived, because you don't want that templated uh, form, it's really a form at that point, to be archived. You want the completed one. So what happens is that form is going to show up, say, in this folder. I just take the file and drag it wherever I need it to go. And I'll tell you, there's a little bug in version 402. I know it's been fixed for the December release. I can't comment. It was being fixed for the um, in, in build 413. I just don't remember. But if you drag, when you drag the file to um, another folder, right now it's deleting the original file out of the template. It won't. In the it's being fixed, but. What you should do is you should take that file and just drag it to the folder you want, and you'll now have a copy of the templated file that you'll be amending and you'll be changing. So suggestion is put it into the administration folder. You'll be able to drag and drop it to the appropriate place that you want to, and the original stays here as the blank form. You'll be working on your form here, and uh, you, know, you just don't want it to be in a folder that's going to be archived. So we can put um, documents, sorry, I do have a note here that was corrected in release 4.13. So if you're on release 4.13, that little bug in the, uh, in the system is being corrected. Okay, so you can have templated documents. You can work on them. 
Um, you can't work on the templated document. You have to drag it somewhere else and to make a copy of it so that you can work on that copy. Just want to take a couple of fast looks at some things into the PDF editor. Um, I'm just going to go into this document in the PDF editor. I'm going to launch it in the PDF editor. Okay, uh, just a couple of things in the PDF editor uh, that you're aware. Some of the control keys that are that are very important. Um, as in Windows, Control Z is your undo. Control Y is your redo. So we have Control Z and Control Y. They're nowhere on your menus, but uh, those functions are available. Control T, as in thumbnail will give you a thumbnail view. So if you go to Control T, it gives you thumbnail view. Um, Control B, as in bookmark, Control B gives you bookmark view. And uh, yesterday we were working with a client, and I'll give them full marks for it. If you want to see the comments view, which is all the annotations, Control M, as in Mary, shows you all the comments. So I can see all of the comments that there were. These are the only items that have been put as annotations onto this file. Um, and I can see the annotations and there's ability to sort. Um, I, I, can, uh, I, I can sort on um, annotations by, um, by author. I can, I can sort many different ways on uh, here. I can sort by page, by type, by author, by subject. You know, there's all different ways I can sort these annotations. So it's just getting used to. So I have a comment view, which is Control M as in Mary. I have a bookmark view if there are bookmarks, which is Control B for bookmarks. I have a thumbnail, which is Control T for thumbnails. Rather than going view, panes, thumbnails, I would be good to go. Now I'm going to make a little change here. I want to open up a multi-page PDF to show you the next thing. Or I don't need it for the next thing, but for two things down. So what we have here is. Um, you know, sometimes you click on the menu and the menu bar doesn't go away. There's two ways you can make the menu bar go away. Fastest way is just take your mouse and move it just a bit to the right of help and click. And it will go away. Um, it, it just makes it, uh, makes it easy to get rid of that menu. It's the fastest way to do it. Because if you're on the menu, uh, the menu just doesn't disappear. If I don't select something, it doesn't disappear. To get rid of that, just go to the right of the help. So I can just go over to the help to the right of it here in this area right here. When I click, it'll make that menu disappear. So a little tip there that might be able to help you when you are working it. Now, the um, just a few more things in the PDF editor. Understand that you can extract pages. Now, this can be really handy when we are in, um, you know, like the, um, I'm in an archived file. Um, I want to extract pages. Um, you, you know, I, I'm, I need to be able to do something. Um, or sorry, this is available to you when you're in a, a work binder or my inbox. What to do is go to thumbnail view. So go to control T. And if you right click, there's a whole series of functions. I can go to extract. So I can tell it the pages I want. So there's some options here. I may have used my control key and selected the pages that I want. So I'm going to go in here and say I want to select page two to three. And I can extract those. And when I say um, once I've uh, moved off of those fields, I can, OK, I wanted to extract those. In this case, I made a new file. Uh, what I can do when I'm extracting pages, um, I can always take pages, right click. And when I extract, we should have the options here. I'm going to save the extracted to a new. I could delete pages after extracted. You know, I've got some options of what I do. So if I want to save them to a new file, I can browse to where I want those files to be, and I can just say I want those to be, I want those to go off to my desktop, and I now it's going to extract and create a PDF, and it would throw it off and into my desktop, and I have those, uh, I have those files available to me wherever I said I wanted to extract them to. So we have the ability to just select the pages we want. We have some options to say what I want to do with that file. And then if we want, we could uh, save that file somewhere in Windows. I could have the file still here. Um, you know, there's just some options of what you want to do with the file. If I have a file that's in the archive and I want to extract some pages, well, I'm going to send a copy to my inbox. And from the inbox, those files there, then I can extract out of. OK? So I just want to touch on three more topics. Um, I see I'm going to run out of time before I get to the last one that I actually wanted to hit on. Three more topics I want to touch on. And I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. So you're just going to have to bear with me for a second. Again, I'm going to have to change my presentation. 
um, across to the, I'm going to change my presentation across to the other screen. Let me get my PowerPoint back up. Let me open the presentation, and I'm going to show my screen one. And I'm just going to wait for it here. There we go. And let's move to, let me get to the right screen here. And set that. And let's move there. And this is not cooperating, so I'm just going to manually. There we go. Here we go. So three things that I'm going to do by virtue of showing them on the screen, um, because they're, they're items I have to talk through, and they also have places you have to navigate to. You can set the docket PDF editor as your Windows default. The way to do that is you would go to a PDF file, something that's maybe in Windows, um, something that's being saved in caseware. You can right-click on a PDF. Don't open it. Right-click on it. And what you're going to do is you're going to want to go to set as default, and then you're going to want to select the browse button. So I actually have missed a step there, which is set as default, uh, select default. Then you select the Browse button, and here's where you have to go. This is where you have to go in your system from your C drive. You're going to go to the program files. Now, it's either x86 or if you, have if you don't have x86 program files, it's just under program files, to the docket suite 4, to docket 4, to the PDF editor, and then you double-click on it. If you want to set, this is the critical thing right here, is where you have to browse to. Once you've done that, then it becomes your default program in Windows which means if you have anything on your desktop, anything that's filed on the server, if you're utilizing caseware, and you're using one of those products, it becomes your default PDF editor. So it's, it's a, a slightly different process uh, to set this up in version 4. And the main reason I wanted to show this screen is just so that we had this item right here. Two more defaults that we have is, let me move on to the next screen, is you can set up centralized tick marks. Now, with centralized tick marks, what, how it works is basically you need to copy a local tick mark file to the server. So you're going to copy it to the server. There should be a space in there to server and click. Can I get that space in there? Yeah, there we go. You're going to uh, you're going to copy a file to the server. So what you do is you're going to go into this location. This is C users, whatever your username is, but your Windows username. App Data, Roaming, Tracker Software, PDF Exchange Viewer, 2.0, Stamp, Tick Marks. This is where you have your local, this is where your local tick marks are saved. And what you can do is if you go to where the docket server is, to the client setup stamp, you copy that file in there, what happens is that becomes the standard file that will be utilized by everyone for their tick marks. So you could take tick marks. If you want to make some adjustments to them, you could adjust tick marks. You can add new tick marks. If you put them into this location, if you copy your file into this location, that becomes the standard. When someone logs into Docket, it automatically says, hey, is there something here in this file? If there is something here in this file, this tick marks file, what will happen is it will then say, OK, that's the tick mark file you're going to use, and it copies it into this local field. So every time people will log in, they'll be using the server centralized tick marks. And that will be the same whether they're in uh, caseware, whether they're in a docket, they'll be using this centralized file. If you want to make changes, what you do is you go into the centralized file. You revise the centralized file, and then when people log in the next time, they're going to get whatever the changes are in that centralized file. So you can have the centralized tick marks. Um, I am looking to. Uh, send out to everybody participating a copy of these notes so that you'll be able to get the notes of where the files are because um, I realize that these are really long and the, the hardest thing here is getting to the right location but you can set up centralized tick marks so too we can set up centralized watermark profiles each person has a local watermark profile what you can do is you can amend your profile and set all the profiles that you want to be that will be the centralized um, watermark copying from this location to a location on the server. When you take that local watermark file and copy it there on the server, what happens is the same thing. When people log in, they will automatically, effectively have access to that. Um, they will be utilizing that centralized file. It overwrites their local file. Now, one difference that we have with centralized um, 
Well, sorry, I didn't move the file ahead. I was on the wrong screen. I apologize. Here we have centralized watermarks. So there's a location where the local file is. There's a location to post it to on the um, to post it to to get it centralized. Once it is centralized, that everybody, when they access their watermark profile, they will be seeing what was in the centralized file. The only difference that we have here when you're utilizing, you want to make changes to this, you cannot go in and actually change the centralized version. What you have to do is go into your local version, you update it, and then you copy it so you would make changes, whatever they may be. Maybe you're adding some new watermark profiles, or you're changing some existing ones, and you have to recopy it. Because there is no direct facility here. When we're changing tick marks, I can just go in and add and delete a tick mark. Here I'm actually changing a profile that the system is creating. So I have to change it locally, copy it back onto the server, and then those changes will become effective for the local user. So it's just, you know, it's just a slightly different change process, but as long as I will take that and I'll bring that in um, and I'll make those changes, then I would be good to go. So there's uh, a whole bunch of different tips and tricks, some of the ones for centralized watermark, centralized profiles. Um, like I said, I'm trying to get a way that we can distribute these notes to you so that some of these places where you have to drop files and pick up files, it be pretty hard to write those down, but so that those things will be available to you. Um, I should know in the next day or so how I can do that. At worst, I can email you all, but uh, at best, I'd prefer to find an automated method. So we've come to the end of our uh, tips and tricks. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to just turn this over, Paul, and uh, maybe we could talk about some of the uh, we could talk about some of the uh, questions that came up. But maybe we could go through some of those and uh, see what we have. Okay, hi Don. Um, thanks for doing that. That was great. Um, there's a couple of questions here that uh, I think would be helpful for others. Uh, one of the questions was. Can you set the column view um, as a default in the inbox? And so the answer is yes, you can. You rearrange the columns the way you like, and when you close your inbox, that will be persisted. Um, and the next time you open your inbox, you should see the same column layout that you that was there when you closed it. Okay. We have now, another one. Can I just stop for a second? When you say close your inbox, it's actually you have to exit the software, correct? Uh, no, each form, when you close any given form, those values are persisted. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you. The second one was a second question about persistence, and it's about how can we set the default view um, preview for a binder, whether you want it with the previewer laid out at the right or at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And the answer is that when you close your binder tabs, whichever way the last one you closed was is the way that the next one you open will be. Okay. Um, now, to, to, to question on is there not a bug in persistence right now, or there was a bug in persistence in 402 for a binder? There, it, there is a fix that was done to persistence that's in for the December release. So, so if people might aren't... Be experiencing, sure. If Go they're ahead. not getting that behavior, they may be running into that specific circumstance. Okay, thank you. Um, another question was when you were going through the hotkeys, um, uh, there was a question about is there a hotkey to start the calculator up in the PDF editor? Um, not currently, but it's a great suggestion, and so I've noted that, and we'll see what we can do about getting a hotkey in there for the calculator. Um, another question was, let's see. Uh, one was, I think it was the, um, yeah, can you delete pages directly from the inbox? Uh, currently, you cannot do that. The way you have to do it is to open the document and do it from there. Open um, the PDF editor then and you delete the pages. You in go the to the editor. thumbnail and delete the pages. Correct. Um, there's a new question that just came in, is there a way to mass batch new binders? So I think that's uh, like batch creating. Yeah, batch creation of, of new binders. Okay. Um, I think that you know typically wouldn't that be people are going to be rolling forward binders. So in, in year one, 
In year right. one, so exactly. Two scenarios. So if I'm in year one, let me just kind of get back here into a client search. Uh, I, it, it, I can, um, if I go into create a binder from a template, which is the plus sign here, I have the opportunity, if I want, to select multiple clients. So I could be selecting, I'm just using my control key. Uh, maybe I've got a whole bunch that are in a range here. I can use my shift and control key. Uh, I could be selecting a large number of clients here. And for all clients that are highlighted, I'm going to actually be batch created. So we do have facility that whenever you are creating, so this is usually very common in year one for business because maybe you're creating all your 1040s or your, your T1s. Um, you know, year two, though, Paul's comment was valid, you're going to be utilizing a rule forward capability. And when you rule forward, it automatically creates the binders for you. So we do have batch creation via rule forward. You're rolling forward a batch. And we also have it when you're creating from a template. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Okay. Um, Sorry, there's just some coming in right now. Mm -hmm. So someone's asking if we can set the default to delete original documents when using the combined feature. So that they want, yes, I don't believe you can do that now, but we have had that request from others. So we will. I, can, um, I could help there, Paul. Oh, I, I thought that it re kept your last, what you did the last time. So that when you check the box to delete, my understanding, if I remember correctly, and my memory's not always perfect, my understanding was that it remembers what you did the last time. So if I, I thought that if you said I'm going to delete, that next time when you came back into the combined function, um, it was remembering to delete. Now, I might be wrong, but I thought that it remembered that as a default. That, that could be the case. Um, then we also have people, though, that are asking for it as a firm-wide setting. Okay. So, okay, well, sorry, Beth came back and said yes. Or she said it does not keep the last election. Okay. But yeah, I, I, I can see it as a firm white setting that it becomes a default that whenever you combine it deletes. Um, if it kept the last setting, that would also be handy. It could be simpler than creating another firm white setting. But that's just a, a developmental uh, option. Um, I think that's, that's all the questions I have right now, Don. Okay, we've pretty much used up the majority of our time. Um, you know, I, I'll, like I said, I'll, uh, we have made a recording of this. Um, this recording will be put onto our website. Um, this recording will be sent to you, a link to it via GoToWebinar. So we appreciate that you have spent your time with us today. Hope that this session has been of use. Like we said, December 17th is the uh, um, highlights of our December release. January 7th will be a pre-tax warm-up. So we look forward to seeing you in the future on our Investment Builder Series. And on behalf of Docket, thank you very much for investing your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you.